One, two, one, two. I'm in the center, at the very back. Can you all hear me all right over there? No problem? One, two, three, four. One, two, three. It's a crisp early morning on the southwest shore of Lake Calhoun in the Twin Cities. An air of expectancy because the Phil Donahue Show is about to begin its taping of its nationally syndicated television program. And for some of the people who weren't able to get out here and see Phil Donahue in person, we've put together some interviews with his staff, with Phil Donahue, of course, and some of the other people who did get a chance to see him in person. All of this we call the Donahue Happening. Two minutes? Two minutes, okay. I'm so nervous. Okay, just relax. Okay, thank you. You on all those other shows. Stand by. Fade up for music in. All right, that's good. That's good. Ready to dissolve one. And dissolve one. Ready to insert three. Dissolve to the insert. That's beautiful. That's fine. Come away. Come away, number one. No kidding, you, uh, you have a way of, uh, have we got PA? Yes, you can hear me. You have a way of uh, weaving yourself into our uh, consciousness and our memories. We will, it'll, we will never forget our week in the Twin Cities. We're sorry only that it has to end. With this, our last show from the beautiful upper Midwest, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. You have been sensational. Thank you all very much. Do you watch uh, the Phil Donahue yeah, show? Every morning, faithfully. Every morning. <laughs> How do you get up that early? I mean, it's on at 8 o'clock in the I'm morning. I'm all alone between 8 and 9, and I love that hour. Is there one show in particular that Phil Donahue has done that stands out in your mind? All of them. I love his honesty, and he seems to be a people person, and seems to be uh, well, very sympathetic and loving and soft and gentle. <laughs> You're such a perceptive person. Do you, um, when you interpret questions that the callers have, is this something that you just comes about naturally, or is this something that you've really had to work at as far as being so perceptive of what people are feeling or what they're trying to explain. Well, I didn't, uh, I don't think of that as especially, I think most of us have that. I, I find the callers to be rather articulate, especially, and the audience, uh, it's interesting the, uh, the comments we get about how good the audiences were. We'll get all kinds of compliments on you. It's too bad you aren't there to appreciate them, you know. Say, boy, those women in Minneapolis. And the, s the suggestion is that somehow women aren't supposed to be articulate. I think it really conveys a sort of sexist view that all women care about are covered dishes and uh, needlepoint. Certainly our show has demonstrated that isn't true. And it's, you care about more than just soaps and games as well. So. 
<laughs> Dick Mincer, who is uh, one of the people behind the Phil Donahue show now in the Twin City area. Uh, Dick, being the executive producer and the man who makes a lot of those initial decisions, when did you first decide that the Twin Cities might be a location? Well, we had been approached uh, actually as about two years ago to come to Minneapolis, and it, and it really takes about that long because once you start communicating with the station and they, they start chatting with us, then we have to, first of all, realize that we're already backed up with, with cities where we, where we are going or where we have just come from. Uh, so really, it was not until the sum this summer that it really heated up. We knew we were coming, at least we, we thought we were, and Minneapolis was very excited, the people at WCCO, about putting it together. And we put together a tentative date for September. And uh, I would say that went back to May, June, somewhere around there. Do you, do you find that the people here are like people in all the other cities when you come to town? They get so excited and they're really ready to participate and get yeah, involved I, in the show. I really do. I, I think that uh, no matter where we go, the show remains the same like for people. I, people say that, or some people say that, well, the audiences in New York are different than the audiences in California or they're different than the ones in Washington. We've done almost 3,000 shows. <coughs> Speaking to some of the most controversial issues you can imagine, and we have never, ever been taken to court. Well, the company that owns the show obviously has lawyers, and of course, you know, they, they sometimes get really nervous when they see what we're doing, but if there's anything that our show has demonstrated, it is that the public is prepared to accept a lot more on the tube than the decision makers in New York and Los Angeles give them credit for. I mean, you know, you're not going to collapse if we talk about uh, some of the issues that you know, with, people will go to a cocktail party and gab all night about a certain issue, and if I dare discuss it on the air, they go crazy. I've never been able to understand that. I do think, though, that most of those folks are in the minority. Phil Donahue has a very special relationship with his audiences. I, I guess I, that has been said about a great many performers, and I don't know if Phil likes to consider himself a performer or not, but certainly he has a remarkable love affair with his audience, doesn't he? Well, I think... I think the success of our show, and uh, yeah, you're right, Phil would not like to be considered a performer. Uh, Phil really looks at himself more as a newsman or a, a newsmaker, but I think the, the success of our show has been the audience involvement. We, have, we got away a long time ago from saying, okay, listen to what we have to say. Here is our guest, and this guest will tell you exactly what the answers are, and, and that's our show. Instead, we said, if we're going to have a guest, and they're going to be talking about issues that concern women, why can't the women ask the questions? And I think Phil's the first to admit that some of the very best questions we have ever gotten have come not from Phil, but from members of the audience. So there is a, there's a participation, there's a touching that goes on in, with our show that just doesn't happen in, in other programs. I feel that we've always had sex education in the schools, only it's been on the playground and in the locker rooms. And I totally disagree that we ought to teach healthy releases such as petting, I go along with that. Thank I'm you. sorry, I'm confused. What do you go along with? I go along with the fact, teach them healthy, different ways to have sex. You like, support like, her position. I support her position. Because the locker room in the playground was a, not a very good school. Well, that's not a good school. You're getting the wrong ideas. Why not bring it into the classroom and teach the right things? Teach them healthy ways to release themselves and have fulfillment. And maybe we'd see less pregnancy if we were educated. concerned with uh, teenagers fulfillment why can't we just teach young marrieds good for you you work it very carefully with the audience uh, it's it's not just go on the airtime and let's let's have at it you build up to that moment don't you i don't think audiences just happen i think that uh you have to continually remind them that you care about their uh, comfort and that you're you appreciate their being here it's inconvenient to get here. Many women have to get babysitters. You've got to make breakfast, perhaps, for the family and get dressed and, for, you know, arrange for the transportation. It's, so when people come, it's a little like having people in your home. It's very important to me that they enjoy themselves. And I think I really do try extra hard to ensure that they know that I'm glad they're here. And with an audience this size, it can be, you can lose at least half of them like that. If you spend too much time over here, Everybody wants to know what you have against this side. So there are, there are a lot of things that go on, it's true. Uh, and there's an intimidation about television, the cameras and the people, and the, everybody's afraid they might say the wrong thing. And 
I try to let them know that I hold the record for bad questions and that, <laughs> that uh, they follow a long line of nervous people who've, who've appeared on our show. And usually that works, especially if you have a guest who's accommodating and will speak directly to their question. <laughs> Gosh, we're going to miss you, I'll tell you. Just want to make sure everybody's with me here. Okay, I'll get to you here. Questions for Richard, all right? I need questions for Richard. All right. All right. All right. All right. Your hands are so cold. What is this? Yeah, gray hair, you have to ask a question. We stick together. Yeah, any time. That's, that's inside talk. Go, hit me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Richard Dreyfuss is just uh, waiting to go on stage with Phil Donahue. A moment of great anticipation, right? Hey, I'm, uh, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to give him a couple <laughs> good swift ones. <laughs> this is practice for you. Yes. We decided to warm you up before you met that crowd of 3,000 people. I'm, I'm imagining that you're another, no, another 700 people, so I'm getting into it. Some days I feel like I'm another 700 people. I wish I could I be. don't want to say anything. <laughs> you know, I read an article on you in a magazine called... It's not true. None of it is true. <laughs> All right, but it was about your apartment in New York. It not said true. Richard None of it Drivers, is true. <laughs> it said Richard Drivers does not allow living things in his apartment. On, a, on an anything but temporary basis. Oh, I see. Yes, I'm the only permanent living fixture. So no plants? Mm-mm. No goldfish? Mm-mm. <laughs> Guess that answers no. that. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do take overnight stays from, from some people. <laughs> well, I'll fly it next week. No, cut, cut. <laughs> Would you kindly welcome the talented and the very popular Richard Dreyfuss, right here. Yesterday was so exciting for me to sit in the audience and watch your show. And afterwards, a uh, few of us were discussing it, and they said, yes, people would come to see Phil Donahue regardless of the guest. Do you feel that way, that you have that kind of command? Well, I think, there are, I think people are... Uh, I, we find people very appreciative for the show. I mean, what we do is different. It's, uh, it's different from any other syndicated show, for sure. I think we speak to more issues more often, more thoroughly, that issues that women care about than any other show. And so that's a gratifying experience to see this kind of reception that we're getting. To make no mistake about it, it, it ought to happen to everybody. It's a, it's a very nice feeling to uh, be able to collect this many people in a beautiful park like this mm -hmm. at that hour of the day. Uh, I think they come to see it all. I think they come to see the show, maybe get on the TV and have their mother-in-law and Duluth see them. And that's fine with us, too. That's legal. We've seen so much of you lately. Uh, what was the turning point in your career? Which films seem to have been the turning point? Well, there were a couple of turning points. One was, uh, like, there were the first two or three, American Graffiti, Dirty Kravitz, and Jaws was one hunk. And then Close Encounters and The Goodbye Girl especially. Kind of... Two. One. Would you make another movie like Inserts? Two. Absolutely. together a show like the Phil Donahue show that everyone just adored here at Lake Calhoun must be a major effort and Pat McMillan who is one of the producers on the show it, it really takes a lot of energy and time doesn't it to pick out a location and get ready for a remote like this 
Yes, I think when we go on the road, probably the location is the most important factor of the success of the show, really. And a lot of people think, oh, we have a million places to do it, but there's usually just one little thing wrong with it, but we haven't found anything wrong with this so far yet today. I have watched it for several years, and it seems to me that Phil Donahue himself has gone through a change, uh, becoming more aware of women's problems and more involved in, in what women are interested in seeing and maybe less chauvinistic. Have you found that? I think uh, he has, obviously. Uh, when you see 200 women every day, you have to learn a little something about what women are interested in. However, he's had a lot of changes in his life, and he's lived through a lot of things, which a lot of people go through, and he knows all the problems. He has children, for instance, so he knows what it is to have a child that's sick, or what you have to do when a child goes to school, or the problems that get involved in schoolwork and so forth, and uh, raising children. And he has custody of his four boys himself, and he's kind of, he's done laundry, you know, so he, so he, he really yeah, can relate. He goes to the market, you know, so he, he really knows what it is. Yes. Bill, I was so impressed with the show on the Son of Sam victim. Yes. Um, I thought you handled it so well. It was so emotional. Have you gotten any feedback on that, or do you plan to follow up on it at all? Um, we probably should. She's talking about a show we did with the uh, survivors of the Son of Sam uh, tragedies in, in, in New York. Um, I, I think you make a good point, uh, and you've reminded us that it's the kind of show that we really shouldn't just leave out there. We should find out how they're doing, and... Thank you for the idea. I'm sure we, uh, we should kind of reopen that and find out how everybody is. Uh, yesterday, in your audience warm-up, I heard some people asking you some pointed questions about your relationship with Marla Thomas, and you handled it very, very nicely, asked them for a little time and so forth. But has you, has the experience of being in that position yourself, changed your feeling about the way you must ask those questions now? Well, I think that uh, if Burton Reynolds is going to date Dinah Shore, that he has to, he has to, because of his celebrity status and hers, accept a, f a certain amount of, uh, of inquiry and curiosity about that. Yeah. Bill, yeah. personally, I'd like to know if uh, you and Marla have any marriage plans. Uh, I understand the curiosity. I understand celebrity journalism. This is America. I believe in the First Amendment. I, I understand that there are, a f you can sell a few magazines if you can get the picture of these people together holding hands and so on. So I, I deal with it. I, I, uh, I frankly think that uh, we live in a world where very few people are getting much attention, and, and I get a lot. I understand it, and anybody who wants to take my picture or ask me about Marlowe is welcome t to ask the questions. I, it has to be said that I have to be in charge of the answers, and I don't want to tell people more than they want to know. That's beautiful. Okay, fine. That's great. Ready to dissolve to uh, one on a boat. Dissolve to one. Widen out. One. Ready to insert three. Insert three. While all of the activity of the Donahue show is taking place out near the lake, Ron Weiner is sitting in uh, his office back here <laughs> calling all the shots. Yeah, this is a portable control room you see behind us here, uh, what we in the television industry call a mobile unit. Um, Portable uh, control rooms are used whenever shows are done outside of a studio situation. Uh, is it is it a difficulty? Is it an added difficulty to do a show in a mobile situation? Uh, not not once you get used to it. The problem is only uh, uh, one in orientation uh, for the first uh, few uh, moments, really. Once you learn where the monitors are and you know what you're looking for, uh, very quickly you get to the point where you drop into a slot and it's all it all starts reflexive it all becomes very reflexive and after once once we establish where i'm at and i know who the cameramen are i'm at home and it really doesn't bother me too much ron the applause over here is because phil donahue just came on the set right uh, working with one man exclusively for a long period of time is is really becomes a kind of teamwork situation doesn't it you, you almost can predict what he's going to do and when uh, 
Yes, that's true. I can. I'm almost uh, always telling the cameraman to get back to him because I know when he's going to come in and talk. I normally don't like to keep a camera off of him too often, but in order to pick up the reactions of the people and try to get the viewer at home to identify with what's happening here, I, seldom, I sometimes have to take a camera off of Phil. And uh, the, the, uh, the getting used to it uh, part is, is when I can uh, decide when Phil's about to talk. Something I hear, something in the air, there's just some piece of timing that I've come to, uh, to acquire. And Hello once again from uh, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. We are on uh, Lake Calhoun, and we've even got uh, Canadian geese coming to make us really look welcome, and uh, certainly we're grateful for the more than 2,000 people who come out here each day during our week's stay in one of the most beautiful, the state of 10,000 lakes. Who wouldn't want to visit Minnesota? More importantly, who wouldn't want to live here? You're all very, very fortunate. Do you have trouble keeping up with him? Uh, sometimes. Uh, sometimes he has trouble keeping up with the rest of the staff, too. Good. That's good to hear. Uh, is he going to watch this? <laughs> you hope so. Uh, no, he does have a lot of energy, and I think that's par a part of his success. He has a very high energy level, and he works as hard or, or even harder sometimes, I think, than everybody else on the staff, because there'll be times, there a few times, now sometimes he leaves early, but a few times he'll be there at night when we're all leaving, and you hear him calling Washington on the phone, a reporter friend of his, or trying to get some background information on the show he's going to do the next day. So. He stays very much in touch with what's going on all the time, and he books some of the shows himself. He'll pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, you know, you want to do the show such and such a day. So he works, too. He doesn't just do the show and go home. We really do have a team effort. We do 240 shows a year, and it's not possible for any one person to, to come up with the creative material uh, to, to make the, every show fly 240 times a year. We're very aware of how dependent we are on each other, especially me since I get all the bows and the attention and the autographs and the money, so to speak, I have to be, I have to continually remind myself that uh, there are a lot more reasons for where we are than me. And uh, I hope that <laughs> these outrageously creative people who work for us know that I'm grateful. You know, would you kindly uh, help me in welcoming uh, your native son, the man who, uh, on whose desk the buck stops for civic affairs here in Minneapolis, the mayor of Minneapolis, Mayor Al Hofstad, right here. <laughs> mayor, thank you. I appreciate you coming over. Well, thank you very much. And we want, to, we want you to remember us, and I'd like to read this proclamation for you. Right. Whereas Phil Donahue has consistently offered quality entertainment throughout his long career in broadcasting, whereas he present, presents a wide variety of issues and topics, and whereas he proves it's, it's possible to be both entertaining and informative, and whereas his enthusiasm and his respect for his audience and his guests is apparent in his approach and manner, and whereas he has significantly raised the level of TV pro programming pro by providing intelligent as well as entertaining shows to his viewers, whereas the citizens of Minneapolis appreciate Phil Donahue's week in our city. Now, therefore, I, Albert J. Hofstad, Mayor of the City of Minneapolis, do hereby proclaim Friday, September 29th, 1978, as Phil Donahue Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice of you, really well. Thank you very much. And much good luck to you. And welcome back. Thank you. Yes, we'll be back. Mayor Hofstad. Thank you very much. Um, wait till I show this to my kids and my grandchildren. I'm going to say a whole day for you. Are you coming back to Minneapolis? Are you kidding? I said we shouldn't be leaving after all this attention. I'm sure we will, yes. I get such a wonderful, warm feeling from Phil Donahue, the, the, the special care he gives to his audience. It's really sad to see him leave the Twin City area. It is a feeling that Twin Cityans have shared for this last week. The Phil Donahue show and its staff is now gone and back in Chicago, but they are still with us right here on Channel 4. We hope that you have enjoyed our representation of what it takes to put together the Phil Donahue show on what we call the Donahue Happening. I just wanted to thank you for having an issues type show on for women at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's kind of a compliment that somebody thinks that much of Housewives to have a, a really good show. On.
I would come back and see him no matter where he was. <laughs> and just truly because I think he's a fascinating person to, to listen to, his ability with people. Um, I guess in the environment we have, everything is so extremely assertive that it's nice to know that there's someone that really likes people. I like listening to him. He's very interesting to watch. I really like variety. That's great. I mean, like they said, if you had one subject all the time, you'd get, you know, you'd turn it off. You wouldn't enjoy it. So I really like a variety. That's, that's great. I have a lot of admiration for the man in the way he plays devil's advocate to get the most out of the interviews. Oh, I watch him every morning, and I just wanted to see if he was the same as in person as he is on TV. Was he? Definitely. <laughs> We had to impose upon Phil Donahue in the middle of a play. I hope we didn't. That wasn't a busted play, was it? That we got? No, we're working on a new. Uh, we have uh, multiple uh, offense, and of course, because the defenses are getting more complicated, obviously you have to stay on top of your X's and O's, as you saw. <laughs> yes. I thought uh, Wayne Dyer, as your fullback, was a little bit weak. I think you should replace well, him. Well, he can't get off the blocks as well as he <laughs> used to. You know? he, he doesn't. Uh, he slowed down quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. I mentioned this as being one of the world's largest studios. It's working outside. It, it does certainly imply some problems, but uh, are there compensations other than the... Oh, I think so. I, uh, we couldn't have been blessed with better weather this week. And uh, um, the only problem really is that an occasional jet that'll go over will kind of be distracting. But yeah, I think that's a small price to pay for the payoff of the, the visual payoff that we get being outside. Yesterday was so exciting for me to sit in the audience and watch your show. And afterwards, a uh, few of us were discussing it, and they said, yes, people would come to see Phil Donahue regardless of the guest. Do you feel that way, that you have that kind of command? Well, I think, there are, I think people are... Uh, I th we find people very appreciative for the show. I mean, what we do is different. There's, uh, it's different from any other syndicated show, for sure. I think we speak to more issues more often, more thoroughly, that issues that women care about than any other show. And so that's a gratifying experience to see this kind of reception that we're getting. To make no mistake about it, it, it ought to happen to everybody. It's, it's a very nice feeling to uh, be able to collect this many people in a beautiful park like this mm -hmm. at that hour of the day. Uh, I think they come to see it all. I think they come to see the show, maybe get on the TV and have their mother-in-law and Duluth see them. And that's fine with us, too. That's legal. It seems to me that what they're watching, too, is a very special skill that you have developed. And perhaps many of the people watching here don't recognize that as much as those in the business. And I must indicate to you that in your audience during this week have been a great many people from the broadcast business in this area and also from broadcast schools watching that very special skill mm -hmm. you have. Thank you. Um, you work it very carefully with the audience. Uh, it's, it's not just go on the air time and let's, let's have at it. You build up to that moment, don't you? I don't think audiences just happen. I think that uh, you have to continually remind them that you care about their uh, comfort and that you're, you appreciate their being here. It's inconvenient to get here. Many women have to get babysitters. You've got to make breakfast, perhaps, for the family and get dressed and for, you know, arrange for the transportation. It's, so when people come, it's a little like having people in your home. It's very important to me that they enjoy themselves. And I think I really do try extra hard to ensure that they know that I'm glad they're here. And with an audience this size, it can be, you can lose at least half of them like that. If you spend too much time over here, everybody wants to know what you have against this side. So there are, there are a lot of things that go on, it's true. Uh, and there's an intimidation about television, the cameras and the people, and the, everybody's afraid they might say the wrong thing. And, I try to let them know that I hold the record for bad questions and that, <laughs> that uh, they follow a long line of nervous people who've, who've 
appeared on our show, and usually that works, especially if you have a guest who's accommodating and will speak directly to their question. Do you think that you intimidate other men, for example, the husbands of the women that, that come to your show and watch your show? I don't think so. I hope not. I, I, uh, I never thought about that. I, most of the, I'm afraid most of the men who, wa who, most of the women who watch us are married to men who really don't know what we do, who don't have an opportunity to see the show. You have uh, a rather sizable staff, something which surprised many people, and all of them work on every show, or have here in yes. any case. And they're busy during the entire show, aren't they? Yes. We really do have a team effort. We do 240 shows a year, and it's not possible for any one person to, to come up with the creative material uh, to, to make the, every show fly 240 times a year. We're very aware of how dependent we are on each other, especially me. Since I get all the bows and the attention and the autographs and the money, so to speak, I have to be, I have to continually remind myself that uh, there are a lot more reasons for where we are than me. And uh, I hope that <laughs> these outrageously creative people who work for us know that I'm grateful. You know, it's interesting because uh, several months ago, uh, there was a lot of talk around the business that, uh, that Phil Donahue was going to the Today Show. Mm -hmm. And at that time, having visited with you and your staff in Chicago a couple of months before, I said, I would think that one of Phil's prime considerations, if that is being offered him, will be that staff that he knows and loves and cares about. Sure. That's true. Uh, I had to think about that and also about whether or not NBC would necessarily be willing to absorb all the people in whom I have yeah. so much confidence. Uh, and then, of course, the more I thought about this opportunity, uh, the more I realized that it has taken us 10 years to build what we have. And I have a lot of security, more than most people in this business. I can be canceled here, and I'm still alive in Duluth. I can be canceled in Peoria. I still have Cincinnati. Unlike the network where one person can end your show or your job while he's shaving on a Tuesday morning, he may not like the last guest you had. He may have his own problems regarding security. And he may be trying to prove his power by firing me. I, I don't mean to create problems, but I do not have all my professional eggs in one person's basket. Mm -hmm. And that's a very nice thing. It's taken us an awful long time to have this sort of broad base of security. But I, I, I didn't want to leave it. Uh, I didn't want to leave this thing that we've built for the chance to go to New York and then possibly plug into a, my, all the kids into a school, get a big expensive apartment in Manhattan, and then maybe in a year from now, I would be doing voiceovers, you know, and not being able to pay my apartment. I want to find out about how you did get started, but first we have to take a commercial break, and we'll be right back. We are at Lake Calhoun with Phil Donahue. You were talking about the possibility of doing the Today Show at one point, deciding against it. But how did the Phil Donahue show begin? Because it's quite, it's a formula that really works all the time. I, had, I did a radio show with phones in Dayton, Ohio, a local show. And the show did very well. We had, uh, I could have a, a long distance guest. You know, Wayne Dyer would not have to come to Dayton to be on. I just called him. And then the people who called in the show could chat with him. And this allowed me, really, in a, with a local show, to, to put on some pretty big shot people. Mm -hmm. I had Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King did the show, Billy Graham, Hugh Hefner. And for a local show in Dayton, that was really unheard of. And the show did very well. I did the show for about five years, and it was just a wonderfully successful local program. And I thought, America, here I come. I'm ready. I've found myself. I had been a newsman and continued to be a newsman while, you know, for the television station while I did this show. I sent my tapes everywhere, everywhere, to Minneapolis, to Chicago, to Boston. And I always got mimeographed responses, you know, would say, dear, and my name would be filled in, we've hired someone else, in effect. So I, I, after that, I felt that I had gone as far, failing to get anywhere else, or to grow, or to go to a larger market, I, I said, well, okay, if this is it, if this is all I'm going to be able to do, then I quit, and I did. I was a salesman for about four or five months when the other station in town called me up and since I had a good reputation with this phone show, they wanted to know how, how I felt about doing that on television. And in November of 1967, our first show began as a local show, and it was local for about two years. 
This is in Cleveland? In Dayton. 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 That's what everybody thought. They, would, they usually said, oh, yeah, the Soapbox Derby. And then I'd say, no, that's after. Uh -huh. So we had a lot to overcome. We were a local show. We had no band. We had no comics. We had no announcer, you know, no band leader who wore funny clothes. We, we had none of the... People really did laugh at us. I mean, it was like a Bob Newhart routine. When we tried to sell the show elsewhere, people would say, now, what does he do? Well, he answers the phone, I see. <laughs> and then people what? People stand up and ask questions. Harry, come here. Tell Harry what you, you know. It was really like that. I mean, people just, the industry was so, so conditioned to the desk and the couch and Charo and Henny Youngman and move down the couch and let's bring on the psychiatrist at 20 to 1 that, that they could not believe that one guest could hold anybody for an hour. And I think what they failed to really understand, and we did too for a long time, that as long as you work the audience in this, it'll play. You know, as a result of the rather considerable success of your program, you have become the kind of, uh, of the personality of the sort uh, you have asked questions of all these years. Uh, yesterday, in your audience warm-up, I heard some people asking you some pointed questions about your relationship with Marla Thomas, and you handled it very, very nicely, asked them for a little time and so forth. But has you, has the experience of being in that position yourself, changed your feeling about the way you must ask those questions now? Well, I think that uh, if Burton Reynolds is going to date Dinah Shore, uh, he has to, he has to, because of his celebrity status and hers, accept a, f a certain amount of, uh, of inquiry and curiosity about that. If, he, if, you don't, if you don't realize that there's going to be some curiosity about a celebrity relationship, then you really don't understand human nature. And, you know, I may, I may be a slow learner, but I like to think that I have some understanding of human nature. And uh, I understand the curiosity. I understand celebrity journalism. This is America. I believe in the First Amendment. I, I understand that there are, a f you can sell a few magazines if you can get the picture of these people together holding hands and so on. So I, I deal with it. I, I, uh, I frankly think that uh, we live in a world where very few people are getting much attention, and, and I get a lot. I understand it, and anybody who wants to take my picture or ask me about Marlowe is welcome t to ask the questions. I, it has to be said that I have to be in charge of the answers, and I don't want to tell people more than they want to know. So, Keep guessing. <laughs> it's been great having you in the Twin Cities. Twin Cityans have enjoyed it, and I hope folks around the, the United States who watch your show have too. Thank you. He has to get back to a football game. Very important. <laughs> I know. <right? laughs> the play has been continuing without him. That's a long pass. You better get under it, Phil. We'll be back in a moment. Don't go away. Phil did take a break for a couple of forward passes and a lateral or two, and now he's back. You, you uh, appear to be in very good shape, Phil. What, what do you do to, uh, to keep yourself in that condition? Well, I, uh, I'm a, a kind of a hyperkinetic person. I, I'm always moving, and uh, I always wanted to be. In my next life, I, I'm going to be Fran Tarkenton. Is that? Well, I think a lot of us on the air have a kind of frustrated uh, athlete complex. Uh, I was the guy who who uh, dated the most popular girl in high school, and then I would be shot down by the quarterback. So uh, I, I do a lot of things. I, I'm, I guess I don't excel at too many, but I, I do everything. Ski, golf, tennis, you know, I just enjoy running around. This is a great lake to run around, by the way. I know that. I I've, give got it my do that. I've got to do that. Stamp of approval. Three? You do more than three? Oh, I cities? do the whole lake, yes. We won't give out any time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday we were talking to Dick Mincer, uh, film, and I misspoke at one point and said, uh, as a performer, and then I said, no, I, I would imagine Phil would prefer not to be known that way, and Dick said, I think you're right. Am I right? Well, I, for a long time I wasn't sure what I was. I, I don't think of myself as a performer, no. Uh, I really journalist? Grew, I, I grew up in a, I, I may be flattering myself, calling myself a journalist, but I grew up in a newsroom in this business. Uh, I'm much more comfortable interviewing Burt Lance than Burt Reynolds. 
uh, I, I was the guy chasing Jimmy Hoffa, you know, back in the 60s. Uh, I was also on at mine disasters, plane crashes, political primaries. Wherever the news was, I'd be there, you know, with that. I had a very famous right hand, you know, you'd see my hand and, the, and I would say, what did it look like when you got here, chief? And then the fire chief would be standing there and there'd be a building falling down behind him. Uh, that's how I grew up. So I suppose that's more reporter than anything else. Well, also on your program, I get the feeling often that you're doing a little investigative reporting with some of your guests. I think if I feel that we're getting somewhere that no one else had been, I, I kind of take over and sort of focus in and try and develop information that I think is new. You warm to that. It's it's interesting to watch. You, you did a, series, a couple of shows with well, Sammy Davis Jr. recently. Yes. That was obviously fun, but yeah. I sense that you really enjoy it when you can do some probing. And yes. I'm, I'm not talk about. I, I don't talk about being mean. I mean probing for information. Well, I I spare me from the from the superstar who has nothing to say but how long it took him to make his last movie or her. I just don't. That's not what we do. And. And we really try very hard not to feature that kind of show. Occasionally we'll get into it, but uh, more often than not, I think we're successful in avoiding it. Do you think people will tell you things that they wouldn't tell uh, a you know, it's news really, person? That's possible. It's very flattering to be on our show. You're all alone. You've got everybody focused on you. You don't have to move down the couch because someone else yes. is coming on. Uh, and I think people genuinely uh, warm to the to the uh, ego gratification that goes with being on our show. And the luxury of time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, to be, to be asked to be on our show is very flattering. It's not everybody that can, it's not everybody that's worth an hour. <laughs> so uh, we, we're, we find that more and more people are anxious to be on the program, and that's, we're very pleased by that. Well, you're worth considerably more than the 20 minutes or so we've given you. Really? And we don't have the luxury of the time you were talking about, but we've enjoyed having you with us, and we've been very pleased that you uh, chose to spend this week in the Twin Cities. Please know how pleased we are. Who wouldn't be? This has been a wonderful reception, and everything about the week has been perfect, including the cooperation of the WCCO crew. They're I, great. I, they are. I broke a microphone. I pulled the microphone right out of the socket in the middle of a break on the first show, and in seven minutes they had it fixed. Little things like that do not go unnoticed <laughs> for a guy who's out there trying to... Well, come back and I'll race you around the lake. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's Phil Donahue. He'll be on here. He's not going to leave us. He's going to be on Channel 4 every morning at 8 o'clock, and we'll be back Monday at noon. We hope you're with us at that time. Stick around. Here comes As the World Turns. Okay. <laughs>